Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's uh, second webinar in our town hall in the series on inclusion. Uh, we're just going to wait for the webinar to fill up while the attendees to start are filing in, and uh, we'll kick things off in just a minute. Thank you for joining us today. I'm going to hand the microphone over to Nick Sargent, um, SIS president, to get us started today. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, for everyone, for joining us this afternoon. As Maggie said, my name is Nick Sargent. I'm president of SIA. Today, we are continuing our series of conversations on inclusion. During the last town hall, you heard from fellow community members of color and their personal experiences in the snow sports industry. Today, we dive further into the topic of inclusion and talk to business leaders and experts about the importance of inclusion and diversity in your business. We thank you for joining us on this journey. It's important that we show up and work on this together as an industry. Together, we can make a significant difference. Special thanks to our series moderator, Salema Masakela, with an illustrious winter sports background and co-founder of Stoked Mentoring, He's the perfect person to help guide this series of conversations, both sharing his own experiences as well as being a master storyteller. Next, I want to introduce the town hall and the panelists. Today's discussion is called Inclusion in Your Business. We have an incredible group of panelists. We are honored to have their participation and for sharing their knowledge with us. I'd like to introduce Libra Clemens, DEI advisor and former global head of diversity and inclusion at PayPal. Harvey Floyd, lecturer, UPenn and Wharton Executive Education. Leanne Kunkel, Chief Human Resource Officer at Vail Resorts. And John Rucker, President, Head to Rolia USA. This town hall will be a conversation between the panelists. We encourage that you submit questions by using the Q&A tool at the bottom of the screen. We'll try to answer them at the end, if time permits. So let's get going here. So I'm going to turn it over to Salema to kick things off. Thank you, Nick, uh, and congratulations on getting Lenan's last name right. I know that was that was really what you wanted to accomplish today. <laughs> Small goals. Um, yes, my name is Salema Masakela. Thank you, all of you, uh, for choosing to join in this conversation. You know, for a lot of people on this call, um, most of the companies uh, that they work at employ mostly white people. Most of the people that uh, consume their products tend to be mostly a white audience. And most of what's taking place on the news that is so heightened right now can feel relative to where you are in the country like it's far away. And so I think that in an industry like this one, sometimes idea the ability like an industry like this one can have the ability to, to to leverage and make meaningful difference can seem like a bit of a foreign concept um, and I think because of that um, even well-meaning people within this conversation um, have had the ability to sometimes sweep the subject under the rug when it comes to truly applying um, some, some some meaningful options in this conversation so this is an immense opportunity at this time. There's an incredible um, energy amongst many people and many businesses that are, that are waking up and realizing, hey, I would like to participate. I would like to figure out how to make a difference, but it can be intimidating. It's an intimidating conversation. And for a lot of people um, and a lot of businesses, they can find themselves unsure at where to begin. So I'm excited for this panel of people that, are, that have been diving into this work. And my first question 
Um, I'm going to direct it at Harvey and Libra. Why do we need to collapse boundaries in order to grow and expand uh, landscapes, in this case, a landscape like, like the, the ski and outdoor industry? I'll, I'll hand that over to Harvey first. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, first, I mean, it's a big question, right? So the notion of collapsing boundaries, I think is really important. We've got to understand what the boundaries are, right. why they need, need collapse. Right? So sort of what's on the other side of that and for whom? So you can take that question a million different directions. Um, but I think uh, you know, we can look at it a couple of different ways, right? Uh, the world is screaming at us right now, right? You can't listen to a radio show, watch a news segment without seeing faces, hearing voices, seeing unrest for all the right reasons. It's beyond timely. And so I think it's in everyone's sort of best interest to really tune in and to wake up, right? And to begin to sort of imagine what is at risk for us if we don't begin to collapse these boundaries. Uh, because otherwise I think it will be sort of far too late for us to sort of catch up to reality, right? Uh, I think people are feeling sort of motivated and, and there's a lot of sort of energy in the, uh, sort of in the movement and in the conversation. People want to see actual and sustainable change. And so if we don't respond, I think we put ourselves, our companies, uh, our shareholders, our stakeholders, right, at risk for losing out on the benefits of inclusion and diversity. And so I think, you know, this is a conversation leaders should be having, right, and sort of really internalizing deeply. Closed doors, what do we need to do to collapse the boundaries, why and, and how, and what, like, how do we take on sort of this, this ownership Right, accountability for the results of doing that now. So, yeah, I mean, for me, I think this is an extension of what Harvey's saying. I don't understand how you run your business. It's a business problem. I think what I tr what I have a lot of trouble with are leaders who are acting as if this is something so complicated, like this really challenging math problem that that cannot be solved but they solve so many business problems on a regular basis so i don't understand how you can have an ex a very exclusive business model and still think that your business is going to thrive it lacks a lot of innovation and so collapsing boundaries to me beyond the fact that they should be collapsed anyway there shouldn't be an exclusive business model um, necessarily, but I just think that you can't run your business and innovate, especially in this time, if you're not thinking about this. And so when I think about some of those industries, and we've all run up against them, like that are primarily targeted at a specific demographic based on whatever the, you know, socioeconomic um, or the historical access has been, I think about those companies that are actually struggling in a, during a pandemic or struggling in general. And so for me, I just don't understand how a business model actually can remain relevant and profitable, much less um, accessible. And that, that has a lot to do with accessibility if you are not collapsing your boundaries. So beyond just the fact that you should be doing it, it's a business imperative. So I think it more kind of a business issue. So it's a, you know, what Harvey said, and I think, and. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I appreciate that. For, for Lenan and John, um, you, you heard uh, Libra say that, uh, I, I think a lot, a lot of times for businesses, you can, they've invented these ideas for why uh, it doesn't matter to them or why they can't do, do this work or why it's not beneficial. What have you found um, as, as in the steps that you've taken with your um, respective companies? Uh, where have been the blind spots and where do you see yourself taking action? What are you learning? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when I, the first question that you asked about collapsing boundaries, when I was reflecting on it in preparation for this, I was thinking about um, the, the choice of collapse boundaries rather than remove barriers. And what I thought about was boundaries are impermeable. Right, so you have some group of people on the inside and then you have people on the outside. And there are norms and beliefs that are created by the people who are on the inside and 
um, without collapsing the boundaries, those are a fixed set of beliefs that don't actually um, serve a broader population other than those on the inside. So we have been talking recently inside Vail Resorts about um, the term click. And what does the term click mean? It means that there is a group of people who have the power to create the perceptions, to set the norms, to establish the assumptions, and then everybody else has to decide if they're gonna play by those norms that have been set. And if people don't identify with those norms, they get to choose out. And so some of the discussion we've been having is how do we really try to uh, take on what those assumptions, what those norms are um, through dialogue and understanding of how are those norms and assumptions affecting the people who are outside of the boundaries? And what impression does that leave with those people who are outside of the boundaries that would cause them to either engage or disengage? And I think that's one of the first places to start is to, uh, you know, Harvey talked about, we have to understand what the barriers are. I think we need to get really honest with ourselves about what are the existing norms and what is it about those existing norms that don't work for the people who are on the outside looking in. And then we have to engage the people who are on the outside looking in to get their perspective on what would have to be true for them to want to be a part of that. John? It's um, a multi-tiered question because I think really we're looking at two questions here. First is to address um, what Harvey and Libra and, and Lenan have already discussed, which is the inclusive uh, versus exclusive nature of, um, of winter sports, if you will. And I think the exclusive nature um, you can interpret that word as literally excluding, and I don't think that that is healthy for us, healthy for the business, healthy for humans. And in fact, inclusivity is one of the things that makes people happiest because they're all together. We are together in that regard. So for us as a brand, what we have done is um, for a number of years, we've looked at uh, a lot of numbers and, and my friends and colleagues know that I'm a fairly numbers driven person. And when we look um, and bear with me for a moment, because there's going to be some numbers we got to jump through for just a moment. Um, if we look at the US population right now, about 60% of the US population uh, is, is white, purely, you know, just reports is white. Interestingly, for the skiing population, that number is significantly higher. It's 87% white. And these are just factual numbers that we, we have to, to understand. And um, what's very interesting to me here is that if we look at uh, in the general population of the US, 13% black, 6% Asian, uh, about 19% Hispanic, these are census numbers. And in the ski side of things, and when I say ski, it's a, just a word I use. It's easier to say than skiing and riding. So it's really meaning the same thing. Um, so apologies to my snowboard friends out there. <laughs> but um, in terms of the skiing population, this is really, it's a sad number, I have to say. Only 1.8% of the skiing population is black. And compared to the general population in the U.S., that is a, a, a massive difference. And so if we look across the winter sports industry and we were to be very honest with the employment, the, the employee makeup, um, it is way out of whack with the American population. It's, it's not even close. It's not a debatable point. This, these are just facts and figures. If we instead look at things through the lens of the participants in winter sports, though the number in my opinion is still ugly, um, it is still, uh, it is in a better uh, state than it would be if we compared to the general population. Do we have a long, long, long way to go? Absolutely, we do. But um, I think that as an optimist, we have to look at it in that regard. And I think we, we're doing um, some things which are helpful. So what can we do as brands to make up this disparity? So 
for the past 10 plus years, us, Head as a brand, we have worked with a number of programs across the country that bring people to skiing and riding. And these programs include things like Share Winter, uh, formerly Learn to Ski and Snowboard Month. Uh, we work with Big Snow, which is an indoor place just outside New York City in the Meadowlands. And um, we work uh, sometimes also with SOS Outreach. And what's so strong about these wonderful programs is the diversity of people that they bring to the slopes. And the one thing that I can say is if we bring people who cares uh, who the person is, the second that they get on snow, the odds of their life being changed for the better are very, very high. And the more racially diverse group that we can get on the slopes, the better we're going to be overall because in time, the people that seek employment in winter sports will start to match the American population much, much better. So that's how we've attached, uh, attacked this problem uh, for more than 10 years. And it's a very long-term play, admittedly, but we think it's a play that will be durable in the long run. Lynn Ann mentioned something about um, norms and it, it, it fits well with John, with the numbers that you just described, because as someone who is, who's been living this mountain experience, I've been snowboarding for 32 years. Uh, one of the things from an industry perspective and also just from the general consumer is that most of the audience has this assumption that BIPOC people are, are, are an anomaly in their space. This idea that it's not really our space or part of these cultures. So what, what are, what, why, do, why do we have a responsibility as an industry to reach out to these spaces and places? Because this is, percept, from a perception standpoint, this is our space, our area. Um, and you see that in employment across the industry. How, how does that change? How do these norms get broken down so that this can change cultural thinking within the in industry and at, and at brands? to start to make a real difference in giving people access to the lifestyle economically. I mean, well, I think, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, please leave her, go ahead. You start. No, I mean, I think it goes back to the original point I made. It's a business, it's a business problem. I don't know how businesses flourish, sustain, maintain, if you're doing the same thing over and over again and tapping into the same resources. And I think it's the same problem or the same challenge that, that we had in tech years ago, it was a bunch of white guys from Stanford and maybe one or two Indian CTOs that got together and created what is now Silicon Valley. It's a no win situation if you're constantly just calling the same Stanford guys over and over again to help you build your model. It cannot sustain itself. And so I think it quickly turned into a conversation about what needs to be done to diversify it so that your business can sustain itself. So yes, I think that there is a outside the norms and I, and I think what's important is that the industry, which to me is, there, there are industries that are very niche industries are doing this in a very authentic way of integrating as opposed to, oh, let's, you know, ensuring that there is access, but there's a point of integration. You know, when I think about these business models, when I think about who's on the board of all these brands and these companies, who has equity and access, how do I invest? How do I get involved and engaged? I don't need to ski, but I also want to be part of it. How do I get a part of that pie? I think that's what to me is important. And then when I think about how it's impacting the business model and to Lenan's point, yeah, I mean, I think it's really important to think about these norms and behaviors, but I would rather see someone that, that looks like me on the board or on the C-suite of any of these companies doing an authentic, having an authentic conversation about the business model and the authentic expansion of their business to include others as a way of reaching out, as opposed to we're going to reach out on the side. And I'm not saying that that's what's happening, but it has to be a very holistic approach. And I, and I say this because and no, by no way is by no way am I assuming that tech is killing it because they're not. But I do think there you are seeing a pattern of changes where you're seeing more 
people of color, BIPOC, Black and Indigenous people of color, um, on board and in more senior positions where they are part of the business conversations. So they are authentically driving change from a business perspective. So I think it's about business. That's kind of that's kind of my approach to it. What what is that that trickle down, um, Harvey, of of companies saying like, okay, we're gonna not just explore this from hiring at the base level of our companies, but from immediately saying, okay, we are going to change what this looks like at the top and bring in voices, perspectives, point of views. How does that trickle down um, to, to really make a difference, as Libra mentioned, at the economics and the business side of this so that it's seen as like an upside to make money? I think it sends a pretty powerful message around sort of visibility and representation. The reality is talent votes with their feet. And not only are sort of black and brown sort of talents looking for places where they see themselves reflected at the highest levels of leadership, which means I'm bringing, right, my expertise, my hard earned expertise. And you're talking about, you know, people who are traditionally overlooked, but exceptionally well educated. And so if I don't see myself represented at the highest levels of your organization, including your board, I have choices. I have options. You may not see and believe that to be true, but as my mother would say, I can show you better than I can tell you. There's also some really interesting sort of data points coming out of Glassdoor's research a couple of years ago that not only are sort of black and brown leaders voting with their feet, but our white counterparts and allies as well are also now making decisions about where they take their talent based on the degree of, of sort of representation, right? Of, of diversity in leadership positions. And so it's not just about, right? BIPOCs, but it is about everyone recognizing that diversity and inclusion really drive innovation, creativity, the search for novel solutions, better business performance, shareholder returns. These things are now critical, right? And I think they're table stakes if we're talking about the future, given the uncertainty that we're experiencing. And so that cascading effect sends a really powerful message. You can tell, you can tell us anything in your annual report. You can sort of nicely configure all the images of people, uh, and that's lovely. But what I'm saying to leaders is, uh, show me a picture of your board. Show me a picture of your executive team. Show me a picture of your top 100. That actually tells a story that if you are not careful, will undermine your best efforts. And it actually puts you behind the pace with respect to innovation and leading change, perhaps in your industry that I think may be becoming sort of far more competitive than ever before. And so that cascading effect, that trickle down is really powerful. And people are, again, sort of waking up to what it actually means in practice. And I think it does actually tell you a story about what, what the organization actually values and what are those behaviors and practices that keep people on the inside or out moving forward or, or remaining stagnant. And, and uh, so anyway, that's how I see that trickle down sort of cascading effect unfolding before our eyes right now. Salama, so can I uh, jump in on that point? Uh, the idea of intentionality I think is a really important idea to get at the outcome that Harvey is describing. It doesn't just happen because the, it, there's too much inertia that is in play by the people who all come together, who have learned how to think a certain way, act a certain way, see things in a certain way. And so to get the, the kind of change that Harvey was talking about, where we get the benefit of new different perspectives and ideas that lead to innovation, that lead to better results, um, you have to make a decision that you're going to um, staff the organization differently. We, uh, we recently at Bell Resorts, we added um, Nadia Rollinson, who is the CHRO of Live Nation, African-American woman to our board. And the perspective that she brought from day one that challenged conventional wisdom, the confidence with which she spoke up with that perspective has already 
caused us to expand our thinking about the way we might approach certain things, how we might structure certain things. And so to just to reinforce Harvey's point about the direct impact of starting at the top is that you get people with a position of power that can bring their ideas and their perspectives that drive decision making and can affect change. And then that indirect um, benefit that Harvey was talking about of people being able to then see that deeper in the organization and be inspired by that and say, I want to be that. Well, if you can combine that with an intentionality in processes and systems in assessment capabilities, such that you can be intentional in pulling people through, then you can make change. You cannot make change just by letting the system run on its own because the system is perfectly designed to produce the result that it's produced. So can I ask you a question, Lynn which I think is really important for everybody on the call. Tell me the process by which you all decided that it was important to bring her onto the board because that's critical. Yeah, so we've been, we've been talking about the fact that we have a gap in this area. And as you watch the demographics, the external demographics change, not just total population, but even where the um, socioeconomic uh, opportunities are starting to shift, we can see that if we don't think differently and open up the sport, break the click, create more access and more interest, it's not just access, it's interest, that we run the risk of not having sustainability of the sport, not just our company, but the sport and everything that goes into that ecosystem. And so back to my point on intentionality, we knew that we needed to expand our board. And we um, you know, hired a search firm. We asked them to really look broadly at uh, you know, the best talent that's out there. We knew we needed human resources perspective on there as well. So we were trying to get a combination of skills. And, um, and we got a great slate of candidates that came back and you know, Nadia rose to the top. Uh, but I say all that because that did not happen. It would not have happened had we not designed the process to achieve an outcome. And you know, we have other examples in the company on gender diversity where you know, we have the most senior operations uh, woman in the industry is Pat Campbell. She leads all of our mountain division and we have a number of women in very senior positions leading our big resorts. It's the, the same thing we recognized that we needed, that we were missing an aspect of perspective and leadership. And we put programs and processes in place to make sure that we got a better mix of leadership thinking at the top. We have not made the progress we need to on racial diversity. And so I think as an industry, now is the time. The, the moment is here and we have to do it. That's a really powerful expression. Um, I, I love the way you you really you made the point that I, I was going to ask a question as, as sort of where where does the industry or where do businesses leave themselves exposed if they continue to think that this is not their problem and you took it past that and said this is about the sport and the lifestyles um, survival why do you think that this industry in particular has been is tends to be reluctant to, to think that, that that can be the outcome. Are you asking me or are you asking somebody else? I'm asking in, gen in general, but. Um, I'll let, I don't know. John, do you want to weigh in on that? I'm not sure that the industry itself has been um, uh, purposefully reluctant, if you will. Um, it's actually a hard question, honestly, to answer. Um, I do think that uh, what hats off to Vale and Linan and what they've done uh, in, 
it's pretty strong, I'd say the, uh, the least. But um, in terms of diversity and things like that, uh, we're very fortunate as a company um, with our CFO being female, our marketing department being female, our global uh, general counsel female. So we do have some diversity as far as the sexes are concerned there. Um, and I'm very proud and pleased to say that. I'm uh, pleased to say we have a number of uh, African Americans working for the company as well. I am pleased to say that. Um, but I can also say, uh, uh, obviously, we have uh, a long way to go as an industry. And um, going back to what I was saying before, I think one of the best ways that we can grow demand, if you will, for working in our industry is to create a passion for winter sports. And um, in the long run, we have to do this because Libra's point um, in the second question, I think is really valid, which is to say, um, companies risk long-term viability if there's not a recognition of uh, a diverse American population and including that diverse American population um, very much in the forefront of their product thoughts, their marketing thoughts, their marketing efforts, and all these things. Because um, going back again to the numbers, if we look at the, the skiing population, it's definitely skewed in one direction. If we look at the American population, it's skewing in a different direction. And in not too many years, those differences are going to be greater and greater and greater. And we might get to the point where those populations are too diverse, too disparate to link up and, and have a long-term healthy viability for winter sports as we um, see business today. And, and some of those things that we do today need to improve. But um, we also, uh, to be very crass, um, we are for-profit companies. And if we want to be long-term long for-profit companies, it does require, and it's very important, that we recognize the population is shifting. And we must, we must take practices and efforts to that end to be more inclusive. And I get back to that really important word. Saloma, just a, another comment on that to your question around why is there resistance? I think this is true in any sort of structural you know, context. The people who are in power do not want to lose power. And so uh, that's where the resistance comes from is the inherent fear that in opening up access, in creating more inclusion, as John said, in welcoming people in, there is an inherent fear that that risks becoming less powerful. And I think that, honestly, I think some of those inherent fears and beliefs is what we have to tap into if we are gonna drive real systemic change. I I, I think your point is so well taken. I now just floating around this um, model of scarcity versus abundance. And I think that's the problem. When everybody is so afraid that there's only one and there's only one me. And I think people lead that way. They lead their teams that way, which creates very toxic environments for people to work, just anybody to work, let alone a person of color or an LGBT person or someone that is marginalized on a regular basis. So we've got to shift this idea of, you know, scarcity to an abundance leadership model. And it's so interesting when I think about this particular industry and to think about all that's happening and, and how you're able to navigate. And I, it's so, I, I think about like navigating a slope and going to the top and, and even just any kind of sport related to extreme to me seems to be that it's also part of a mind over matter. And I think if you're constantly sitting in this scarcity model, I don't understand how you've been successful at what you do if you're actually in this particular industry. So why not use that model when you lead? How about use that model when you think about being a good CEO, a good president, when you're thinking about talent? It's an abundance. It's, it's all about abundance and not scarcity. The second thing, and I saw this and come up in the chat, is around tokenism. I love when people want to challenge folks on tokenism because it's tokenism when it's black people, but it's okay when it's a white man. So I don't, I don't even know what that word is. I don't get it. I don't buy into it. Um, what it is is offering people opportunities who deserve to have them when they typically don't have them. 
And so if that's their version of tokenism, it's a lot, it's implying a lot of, uh, um, there's an in, um, inequality. And that just is so troubling to me. Um, we have this problem all the time. The, the conversations that come up in our talent conversations are, are we lowering the bar? And I sit there and I think to myself, the bar is low. Look at your leadership. They are mediocre, not well-educated, not very smart, but these are the people that are running your companies and or board members. That's mediocrity in my mind. And so when I think about what people are saying, like lowering the bar, I literally cannot even engage in that conversation. And the tokenism is a lot of implications. This is basically opening up the opportunities for people who rarely have the opportunities and of course they're qualified. And so I just want to make sure we kind of dig into that because there are two questions in the Q&A around that idea. And again, that goes back to this abundance versus scarcity model. If you're thinking about it from an abundance, there's room for everybody. Add a leaf to your table and add more chairs. There's not one or the other. We got to stop with that. And I think this is a great industry. When I think about all the stuff that, that's happening in this industry, this is a great industry to kind of start remodeling what it means to be a leader and, and using that abundance model versus the scarcity one. So I love what you just said, Lenan. If, if I could chime in here, I, um, you know, I do a lot of this work, like not just in the front of the classroom, and, you know, but around some board tables with some senior executives. I may get a phone call from a CEO or two or three or four on occasion. That notion of power is really important. Um, and I think we've got to be far more creative and innovative than that because that is going to be exceptionally detrimental to the culture that you want to build and establish in the future. And quite honestly, how you leverage your human capital to truly penetrate this uncertain environment. Because the reality is this, there's no one CEO in America or the world, mind you, that is sort of uh, capable enough of, of navigating uncertainty on his or her own. It's just, it's not the truth. So I work with top teams and what we are finding in our work, and this is alongside one of my, my Harvard colleagues who literally wrote the book called Senior Leadership Teams. What we are finding far more energizing today is when senior leadership teams are really wrestling with the most powerful questions. Now, that means, yes, their power might be threatened because they may stumble onto the questions that literally unearth themselves and their roles in their seats. But it actually could be for the betterment of the company. It may actually widen the aperture on who has access to becoming a part of that top team because, you know, Harvey has come from four or five or six different industries and has been waiting to contribute. And now we finally recognize that he is ready, that Libra is ready, that John or Lynette are actually ready that Saliba can make dynamic and compelling contributions to our bottom line and our future because of the lenses through which they see the world. But if we aren't as a senior executive team, and I would even say, <laughs> if the board isn't curious, so if the board is maintaining status quo, which many boards are, but if the board is not aware of the inherent risk of maintaining status quo and senior leadership teams aren't willing to wrestle with the most profound questions, we will continue to, to move at a snail's pace toward change. And we will actually see other industries pick it up a heck of a lot sooner. We will see people exit the workforce because, I mean, listen, we've got how many flooding the, the no work marketplace right now, the jobless marketplace, where they say, you know what, now is actually the right time to build and scale my own venture. Why? Because I see hundreds of millions of dollars flowing toward the establishment of black and brown businesses. And so now is my time. And I'm going to study what my former organization did poorly, and I'm going to outcompete them. I'm going to leverage the very talent that was hidden in plain sight to them that they overlooked time and time again, performance cycle, promotion cycle after promotion cycle. I'm going to stockpile that talent, and we're going to take on the future. And so if we are still holding on to power, because we, our fundamental understanding of leadership is skewed. We represent a dying model. And there are leaders who will carry us into the future, <laughs> working with our mission and serving it or creating their own and outperforming us. Those are just facts. 
Mm. A series of words. Libra, you, you, you made a really interesting point when you, when, you, when you spoke about the actual act of navigating a mountain. One of my favorite things about uh, these sports that have changed my life is that every time I get up on the mountain, it is necessary for me to have an open mind as to how I'm going to navigate the terrain. I, I cannot have an idea in my head of, of how I'm going to navigate uh, the terrain. What worked on the last run isn't going to work on this run. This whole sport, this whole lifestyle is about exploration and challenging your boundaries. It's the only reason why you practice these things. And to Libra's point, if the industry could literally take the full application of what it is that they're selling, of, we're, of what we're selling, and apply that to how we, we run and grow this, this next iteration of what the landscape looks like, then expansion isn't gonna look so hard because that's how we look at terrain all the time. We're sitting in the chairlift and we're looking over there and we're saying, man, how cool would it be to be able to go and ride that? I wonder if one day we'll be able to open up and figure out how to gain access to that. And it happens and everyone gets excited and it literally fuels the town. And it just seems like within this conversation that that's like usually the fixes are very simple, but the DNA for what this looks like is literally in what it is that's being sold. What are, I guess, sorry, I just went off on a, on my box there, but. I love that. I love it. <laughs> that being said, if, 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 if a business or, 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 or a CEO is on, on this call right now and they're just catching the spirit for the first time, like, okay, I feel it. I realize that something needs to be done. What do first steps look like at various tiers um, to start to make this direction in what is ultimately a, a change in culture in your brand? Um, I'll jump in. Uh, I think it starts with dialogue and creating an environment where people have the freedom and permission to learn, to explore, to ask the hard questions and know that the person on the other end of those questions is going to receive them with positive intent and that they're going to ask the hard questions back and people are going to do their best to answer the questions based on the perspective they bring and through that dialogue common understanding is created that then starts to widen we talked about the boundaries it starts to widen the viewpoint and widen the landscape of possibilities that then can translate into very specific actions but I, I think it has to start with creating an environment of open dialogue i was i was thinking about george floyd's um you know his murder really sparked a national and international discourse that made it okay to speak out on this topic and invited people to boldly um, speak out in ways that i don't know that that level of permission was actually there before and it was it has been really largely through that discourse that I think it's moved. It's become a movement, you know, inside of companies, inside of society, inside of governments. And so I think it's that dialogue that starts the movement. And then it's the prioritization and the commitment to see that through, regardless of the barriers, the adversity, the challenges, the complexities. It's the commitment and the prioritization to see it the whole way through based on the insights that come from the dialogue and learning. One of the, I, I, I don't think we'd be on this call if it wasn't for George Floyd. The series would not be taking place within SIA if it wasn't um, for, for these series events, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, et cetera, in, and also sitting in what we're doing what we're in in COVID, where there's no place to run and hide. So everyone's like, okay, I might as well clean my house while we're here, which is what, why we're having this conversation. And I appreciate you, you, you pointing that out, Lynn. The, the one of the first ex easy excuses 
um, that is, le it's a legitimate barrier. But one of the first things that I hear from a lot of companies is a, those communities that you want us to access are so far away They're, and wealth gap. I don't know if they could afford this. So is it my responsibility to, or is it our responsibility to, to solve for that? I'm, I'm, I'm busy trying to build a business. Can we talk a little bit about this, this wealth gap issue um, and communities being so far away that makes it such heavy lifting in, in, in the minds of many? Yeah, I, I don't mind, excuse me, addressing this point um, because um, certainly time, distance, uh, and finances are uh, three of the things that are most commonly mentioned and discussed uh, when there is a barrier to entry into skiing and riding. Um, and funny enough, I, I would argue that uh, for many, time is in distance, really they're, they're interrelated. And so I think those two things are, for many, are the biggest barriers. Um, and, but certainly, uh, there are some where the finances are by far the biggest uh, barrier to entry into skiing and riding. This is one of the reasons I love these programs like SOS and uh, the groups that uh, share winter that are really working hard to break down these barriers and then to bring people to the sport, regardless of their demographic or of their race. And, and just like Salama, you fall in love with this crazy sport. I mean, I just have this vision of you in your, in your body glove wetsuit. It's just, it's just hilarious to me. You get out there and you're probably freezing and sweating and all those things at the same time. And look where you're sitting right now. You fell in love. And that's what we need to do is break down the barriers for more people to fall in love with this exact, these sports. So I'm very um, passionate about that. One of the things that's mentioned uh, certainly is related to cost. And I can say that, um, you know, Vail Resorts is on this call and Vail here in Colorado is doing some really great things for, for kids. Um, and there are a number of their competitors that are doing some very great things for kids to very much lower the barrier to entry for uh, it, the, the cost, certainly. Um, let's face it, one issue that, that uh, winter sports faces and this, in the long run, does affect the businesses themselves um, and, in, and in turn, who is interested in working for our companies. But if you live close to a ski resort, you're certainly much more likely to take up a sport than if you live a long, long way from one. So um, when we have these great programs, these affordable programs, uh, it certainly helps. And, and the resorts themselves, hats off to them, they are doing a number of things to try to lower the barrier of cost to first timers. And so um, I really do believe that, um, yes, uh, in the long, long run, the more people we bring into the sports, the more diverse our employee ranks will be naturally. And I'm just very excited about that future. I'll take a stab at this. Uh, so then you raise this question around like, what would you do right, sort of like right away? One piece of advice I'm giving many CEOs who are asking me is stop, stop hiring yourselves, All right? So that's an easy one. Don't recreate yourself anymore, All right? So uh, you raise this other issue around, uh, you know, sort of accessibility to diverse networks. Look, I, I, think, I think the distance between your organization and diverse talent is 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 um, let me think about a more dip diplomatic way to say this. I, I think they are as close as your personal network is diverse. Okay, that's that's what I think. So when we talk about sort of proximity to you know diverse communities, of, look, I, I think you have to look in the mirror and ask yourself. How diverse is my own personal network? What links do I go to, right? To meet with, connect with, understand, build new relationships. Like <laughs> if I am locked into my immediate network, that looks like me, sounds like me, because we all sort of share a number of sort of exclusive sort of privileges, you know what, it's going to feel like, gosh, it's gonna take us forever to reach out. Where are they? They're right beneath your nose if, if your network is, is diverse. 
So if your executive team's network is, is not diverse, then guess what? It's going to be a, a, a long reach for you to gain access to, <laughs> to people who are different. So you might want to think about that. You might want to think about uh, how quickly you can expand the board. And I mean, like tomorrow. I, I think another, like I hold up a mirror, the, the mirror of COVID to this mirror of sort of, you know, racial and, and ethnic inclusion and diversity in organizations, right? Like think about how nearly every business in America has had to stop, pivot, pause, identify a new business model, launch a new product or service. And we magically figured it out in about 65 days for many of us, right? We minimized the cost of access. We launched a new product. You know, people who were dentist offices are now selling masks. And it, why? Because it would cost us greatly if we did it. It was literally for many do or die. Many of our companies are either thriving, doing okay, or on ventilators right now. So we have to take it as seriously as we've taken COVID. And it was not hard for people to rally, stand up wartime meeting scenarios, meet hour after hour, day after day. I'm supporting a team that, I mean, six to eight hours a day for 17 consecutive days. Looking through their data, <laughs> wrestling with deep questions, trying to figure out what do we need to do to survive? If we take it that seriously because we care enough, we will find talent, we will find solutions very easily. Right. And, and Harvey, I think it goes back to the original point I was ma making, is this is a business problem. This isn't a diversity. This isn't something on the side that you do and you go out and you volunteer at a camp. This is a business. And so the first thing you need to do is, is approach it the way you did for COVID or for any business problem. If helmets go wrong, if the ski equipment is this, if there's a this, that, and yep, it's the same approach. I think where companies get really confused is, again, it's that really difficult math problem. I'll give you an example. I work with leaders all the time. I've been in this space for so long. And I remember talking to a CFO of a company I've been consulting with. And he was like, can you just tell me what to do? And I was like, okay, so when I get a budget, can I just call you and you tell me how to manage my budget? No, you have, he was like, no, you have to figure that out. I was like, and so you do too. The point is there's no magic wand. It's figure it out as a leadership. If you don't have a board, if you don't have a large leadership, figure out how are you managing all the rest of your business decisions, approach it that way. If you use a special business model to solve all of your problems, diversity, equity, and inclusion should be on that roadmap. It should be on your roadmap all the time. So I think that's the first thing I think you could do. The second, I like what Lenan is doing, and I love this idea of proximity because um, that is a discussion that everyone's having now. It's really about who do you know in your network? Who do you know that is somewhere or someone else's network. And by the way, if you don't know anybody, I guarantee your kids do. If you have kids in school in some cities, I'm sure there are other kids out there that don't look like them. Get to know them. And I think it's just also expanding your network um, so that you can be in authentically, not cyber stalk the one black person that just happened to be on a video call, but I think it's authentically expanding your network. Um, I. Brian Stevenson is always, and so Brian Stevenson is actually the, um, I don't know if many of you know, if you read the book, Just Mercy, or if you saw the movie, Just Mercy, he has, he's doing a lot of work. He has several centers in Montgomery, um, the Equal Justice Institute. And so when Alabama actually gets their act together, <laughs> I would recommend that any and all leaders take a trip down there. That is actually the first thing I would recommend anybody. If you're really serious, go learn the history get to know it. But he also talks about this idea of proximity. And I think it's so critical because I think to Harvey's point is, if you don't know one in your, anyone in your network, you don't have an authentic understanding of their experiences. So everything you do is not authentic. It's actually so like mechanic that it, it, that it falls flat. So I think there's just an opportunity to engage and understand ear to the ground of the various communities 
connect with people that you know or your kids friends or whatever but get to know them authentically and treat them as human beings and not test cases and you know and you know kids or children or a demographic where you have to do extra for um because i think the authentic connection i think is what really makes this a more successful opportunity to start to bridge the gaps well, Emma, I, I want to build on a couple of points that Libra made. One about this being a business problem or opportunity to solve, and two, the idea of proximity. Um, you know, we have a vast network of resorts, and there's a certain segment of resorts that are smaller resorts that are near large metropolitan areas that tend to have more diversity of the population. And so if we want to reach a more diverse population and create interest and access in skiing, it is less likely that someone in Washington, D.C., in a diverse community, is going to decide that they're going to pick up and go to Vail and try their first ski trip in Vail. It is very likely that if we can generate interest, that they might be willing to dip their toe in into a resort that one is not as large, so it's less intimidating. It tends to, for their first time, they don't have to make as big of a financial investment because it could be more affordable to try it. And they're gonna be more likely to see people like them there. And you know, when we when we first went out with you know this strategy and started buying these resorts, I know there were a few confused looks at you know, what is Vail Resorts doing? But I think this idea that one, we're gonna make the investment. So to Libra's point, this is a business issue, it requires investment, we're gonna make the investment. We know that the investment is a longer term investment because we're, we're building access, we're building a network and we have to then generate the interest, but we're gonna build that network in places that allow us to tap into the broadest population possible to create interest, to create access, to drive our business. And then one other point that I wanted to make around these, these challenges and barriers, when I listened to this panel two weeks ago and heard the panelists, the number one barrier that was the theme there was I wanna feel welcome. I wanna feel like I belong. And so as we think about barriers, we need to get beyond the, the building a program for low income kids. We know how to do that. That's easy. You know, buying resorts in proximity to diverse populations. We know how to do that. That's easy. Changing a culture from the inside that makes people feel like they belong there and to have an experience that makes them want to come back. We fix that. We've solved the whole problem. When Nan is invited to the cookout. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be there. Um, to that point, Lillian, that's a really powerful statement. Um, you know, that was a big theme in the last in the last uh, conversation. And I've stated many times that over the course of, of my participation, the one thing that I would love to no longer have is weird looks in the lift line. Whether that, that even if those weird looks are like, we're, we're happy that you're here. Um, I would just like to be. Um, but to that point, and this is specifically for not just you, but for the resort community in general, the traditionally the jobs that at, at the base level in the mountains, there's always been this, this international community, right, of kids from Spain and Argentina and New Zealand and Australia that you, that you meet throughout the mountain that are there for the season. Um, is there a possibility or what does that look like to or is it even happening to expand access to those base level jobs that give someone an opportunity to live the mountain lifestyle, you know, to be instantly a part of community while also earning money, et cetera, et cetera. Is there a way to, to offer that at a different level in this, in this conversation? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. We, we do have some diverse employees, uh, on the mountain, whether they be ski instructors or patrollers or, you know, other um, types of roles, we do not have a programmatic solution to that in the way that we do on the international side. 
A couple of things I would think about about that. I, I think it's a good suggestion um, to consider. And when I think about that, I think about the community, the whole community, because it's not just the resort. We can hire people, we can build a program in the resort, and they're living in that community. So to have people come and feel welcome, not just in the company, but feel like they have a place in the community to make sure that we understand what some of the unique needs might be in that community so that when they're there, they can get their basic needs met. You know, I'll, I'll mention like know where to get their haircut or whatever that might be to help make sure that this feels like a community where I belong. And so I, I do think it's a good idea and one that we should consider. And I think it has broader implications than just the resort itself. I think we need to think um, more broadly about it. And that's why I brought it up because every time I go to the mountain, it's just the one thing that I see. I'm like, there's so much opportunity for people not just to gain work, but to actually be living and learning how to and embracing the lifestyle at the same time in, in a way that now you're able to build that pipeline that you're talking that you're talking about. And yeah, to your point, it's not just, you know, lifties, et cetera. There's a whole slew of opportunity across the landscape uh, where people are coming in to work. Go ahead, Harvey. So if, if I could just sort of highlight something I'm, I'm aware of at the moment, right? Someone may be listening to this conversation real time, hearing that scenario and saying, gosh, I just see so many challenges with that. But if they listen to what you just said, the first thing you said was, I, I look out and I see so much opportunity. There it is. So why aren't we seeking out, right? The, pers the perspectives of people who have a different lens through which they see the world. Perhaps we don't care enough, or we just haven't realized how much value it might add us because we're still looking in the same places for the same solutions. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight that for people who might be listening, right? Some people see challenge, some people see opportunity and a mind field of opportunity. Uh, I think one of the things that we do, we tend to sort of over prioritize the value of people with power. An example is we chase down CEOs. We want them to be a part of everything that we're doing. Um, and this is not a knock to CEOs. I, I get it, right? But like we want them to, to, to sign something that we're a part of or, or show up to be present to speak because we think they will uh, draw an audience. Uh, they will keep the audience captive. We really value their insights, their knowledge. You know, tell us more about how you became X. It's sort of short-sighted. If we're thinking about the future of our industries and our companies, we should be thinking beyond sort of short term benefits and value and really looking at non traditional perspectives, if you will, and people who have them as the future of our industry and how might they inform our future. Would we chase them to the extent that we chase CEOs and I don't think we're there yet. Right. Do I run toward those sort of next generation, uh, you know, skiers. Uh, right, sort of, you know, ex gamers, ex sports who are black and brown to the extent that I, I run toward and chase the other folks that are sort of headlining certain events. And so I think we have our values sort of slightly out of whack. But if we would sort of equally value, listen to the folks who can add insights now and in the future, we position ourselves to do that. Whew. Uh, this has been a, uh, a really pow powerful power hour. Um, I, would, I would offer up the opportunity for any closing um, thoughts from, from across the, the, the panel. John? Apologies for my internet connection when you have uh, four people at home using the same connection. <laughs> well, you know what happens. So that's where we are. But I, I do want to close with... Um, what makes me hopeful about right now? Because um, being the optimist, I, I, I've heard so many uh, wonderful ideas during this panel and thank you to everybody for your candor, your kindness, your wonderful ideas. Um, but back to some numbers, because <laughs> I think there's some really good news and I, I mean this towards the future. Um, and, and first, thank you to my friend Dave Bielan for providing some of these incredible numbers from RRC Associates. And um, um, if we look across the country right now, we have about 13% non-whites who ski and ride. That's not good. But if we look for some glimmers of hope, I think we can find it. Number one, if we look in the Southeast, 16% 
of people who ski and ride are not white. That's a good start. A better number is where Salema lives, Pacific Southwest, Southern California. 31% of all people who ski and ride are not white. That is a really big difference between the national average. And that's very, very, very exciting because it, those mountains look a whole lot more like Los Angeles than other places. And to me, thrilling. And the biggest piece of good news that I, I would like to close with from my perspective is that um, while only 13% of skiers and riders are non-white, if you look at the age brackets, 34 years and younger, about 23% of that demographic is not white. So that tells you that the future is definitely trending in a positive way to having a much more diverse sport. When we have a more diverse sport, we're gonna have more diverse people working in the sport. And I'm thrilled to be able to say that. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you, John. Libra, what gives you hope? Um, I don't know. Actually, John, those are really compelling stats. I actually kind of was like, wow, I had no idea. I think um, with the way that the world is shifting with people moving different places because they, some people never have to go back to an office or, or at least they're not going back for a while, it'd be very interesting to see what that demographic looks like. Um, but it is hopeful. Um, I, I, first of all, the fact that there were like 130 to 140 participants on this panel and the majority of them stayed on while we were rambling to me gives me hope. I think that um, there are more people, I've gotten messages already that are interested in figuring out how to turn this around. So there's interest and it takes a small number to get the bigger numbers. And so I feel really hopeful about it. Um, I, I just wanna make sure that it is done in the most, I keep using the word authentic because I think sometimes it gets lost when it's just overdone and over-exaggerated and it is not integrated. Um, and so, and part of that has to do with people really understanding your demographic and understanding the, 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 the demographic of people that you are trying to engage. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done, not a lot of education and awareness, um, but um, I feel really good about it. I do, I'm very hopeful. Lunan? Um, so as we've really started to expand the dialogue in the company and try to integrate it into our normal day-to-day -day conversations and really make a point to learn and get educated, become more aware, what has been really fascinating has been the stories that have emerged from our employees. Um, ski instructors. We have a, a black ski instructor that we've learned a lot about recently that we didn't know before. Um, and to hear the stories that are so inspiring sort of rise to the top that can help inform that learning, can help build that awareness, can help create this connection. You know, Harvey talked about like, who are you connecting with? Creating that connection that takes it from um, an intellectual exercise to uh, sort of an unsolvable passion to actually go do something about it. I think that's what makes me hopeful is that all this dialogue is turning into passionate action. And if we can you tap into that passion to do the things we say that we should do, I think it's gonna make a real difference. I do, just not just in the business side of it, but also in what that means in the broader, you know, societal journey that we're on. I appreciate, I appreciate that, uh, Lenin, Harvey, John, Libra, everyone. I saw someone in the, the chat ask about what about the seasonality of mountain jobs and that, you know, what happens to the person when that season's over. I wouldn't worry about that because people have been figuring out the seasonality of mountain jobs their entire life. Once you fall in love, and culture, you innovate and you do whatever you can to stay close to it and feed your habit. I think we, we all know that. And one of the last things I'll say is this, the future of the sport of snowboarding 
is a young black kid by the name of Zeb Powell. He is going to be a cooler, more broadly accepted version of Sean White than we've ever seen before. And you can remember this call when I've said it. He's going to be the person that transcends the sport and people are going to look at him as an elite athlete amongst the best athletes in the world. So if for no other reason, <laughs> understand that like the face of snowboarding in the next five years is going to be a black man and it's going to be really exciting. So um, let's get our houses in order for, for this next ride because it's going to be the first time and it's going to be a blast. Thank you all. Um, Harvey, Libra, Lenan, John, this has been uh, incredible. I, I knew that it would be fun, but this was uh, beyond anything I could have uh, asked for. I learned so much from your perspectives and thanks to all of you uh, that decided to stay with us. And I'm gonna turn it back over uh, to Nick. Thank you everyone. What, a, what an amazing uh, panel and what an amazing conversation, one that we're gonna continue to follow and build on. I just wanna say a huge thanks to Salema and all of our guests, uh, the panelists for sure. Uh, we've gotten a lot of questions that have come through during this panel, and for sure, we're going to get get to those um, and answer them for you all. Uh, we'll also have a recording of this session. I think it would be helpful for us to share this around our community for those that weren't here today. I know a handful of people that I'm going to send it to right away. So um, we'll make that available to you um, um, on our website by tomorrow morning. I also want to share our next town hall in two weeks. Uh, is titled Inclusion on the Slopes, Attracting, Growing, and Welping, Welcoming Diversity in Winter Outdoor Sports. So I think if you enjoyed this session, you're really gonna enjoy the next one uh, as well. So again, a huge thank you to everyone. Uh, this is such a great uh, conversation and we look forward to building on it. Have a great day and be safe and uh, we'll talk to you real soon. Thanks everyone.